If you enjoy this program, please like and subscribe. Let those words echo in Dow's Theological Seminary. Let those words echo in the Vatican. Let those words be heard at Moody Bible Institute. Let those words be heard in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Let those words echo around the world. Yeah, my name is Bob from New York. Um, I was listening to some Christian broadcasts, and they were commenting on uh, Zechariah 13. And um, Jesus quotes it in Mark 14 about smite the shepherds and the sheep will scatter. But they also were saying in verse 6 of Zechariah that um, it talks about Jesus because it says, you know, where did you get those wounds in your hands? And he says, well, I got them from in the house of my friends. So I was just wondering, what is Zechariah? Um, what's the context? What is he talking about in Zechariah 13? Um, that's my question. Thank you. This is not just a mere misappropriation of text. This is applying text in precisely the opposite that the prophets intended. This is what you're about to hear. If you are able to understand even a part of it, I don't think your life will be the same. So we talked about the signs of the true Mashiach, the single most important feature of the Mashiach is the universal knowledge of God. See Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. The knowledge of God will cover the world as the water covers the sea. What will happen to all the false teachers, the false teachers? They're going to step forward and admit their lies. And in fact, Daniel chapter 12 Verse 2 tells us about the resurrection. It's one of the few passages in all of Tanakh that describe vividly the resurrection of the dead. And there we see not just the resurrection of the righteous, but also the resurrection or temporary resurrection for the wicked, for shame and contempt. People usually pay close attention to Daniel 12, too. There are many who lie on earth that rise for everlasting life, but many people don't pay attention to the end of that extraordinary passage. The wicked will be brought back, so there'll be clarity in the world. It's very important. When the true Mashiach comes, there won't be a proliferation of religions, but there'll be one faith and everyone will know the truth. No one will have to teach his brother, his neighbor about me, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. The MS will be clear. It's very important. If you don't understand that, you don't understand anything. Everyone understands the MS. So in Zechariah chapter 13, it tells the fountain will be open for the house of David, There'll be a cleansing of all the false teachings and false teachers. They will stand up and they'll admit that I'm really not a prophet. I really should have been a tiller of ground. His own parents will condemn him. He will admit I should have been breeding animals and working in agriculture. In the ancient world, you basically had two fields uh, for a career. You either worked with agriculture, and that includes working with animals, breeding animals, or working with the field, and so on, or you were a teacher, you were, had a, a priestly duty, you held yourself out to be. Look at verse 6. And one will say unto him, Mo hamakos ha'elo ben yodecha, what are those wounds? Bain yodar yad means hand. Yodecha means your hands. What are these wounds? So there's somebody that Zechariah has in mind that's noted for having wounds in his hands, who's a false prophet. 
Omar and he will reply, Asher Hukesi Beis Me Ahavoy. Those are the wounds I received in the house, my friends. This is a false prophet who's who's wounds in his hands. So what's crazy is, is that Jesus at the end of days admitting that he was really a false prophet? But this is what's mind-blowing. Missionaries routinely use that passage to say, ah, here we have an unveiled and unambiguous reference to Christ crucified with holes in his hands. Just like in the book of John, Thomas sees the wounds, so the wounds are there. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Unbelievable! My, if you're if you're if you're wrapping your brain about what you're hearing, and please, please read it in context. This is a precursor to the coming of Mashiach that everyone knows, and all the lies and liars are all going to be exposed. Okay. So this is a crazy thing. So you have to this day, you have missionaries that take Zechariah 13.6 out of context and say it's, we have a reference to a crucified Savior. When in context, you see, it's not a Savior, it's a fool's prophet. Uh, I'm asking you a question, frankly. Can there be something more outrageous? Could there be a more promiscuous misuse, a misapplication, a misappropriation of Scripture in this? Doesn't, if, if this doesn't make you want to vomit, then there's something wrong with you. I Don't be offended, but it's, it's so crazy you have no idea. So crazy. It could be there were commentators in the ancient world who were very nervous about this on both the Jewish side and the Christian side that they say that they rendered it on your back because what's between your hands? So it's your your torso. So on the Jews who lived in medieval France or whatever or they might say that because they don't want to get the Christians crazy. And it could be there are Christians that say that too. But it really says, Bein Yodecha between your hands. It really says that. And it's ripped out of context completely. Ripped out of context completely. And to prove to you, missionaries to this day use it. One caveat, I don't want to mischaracterize, there are some Christian commentators who are more honest, there are not many, but there are some who are conservative Christians who actually in their commentaries are aware of this misappropriation and say, make it clear in the commentary, Christians, not liberal Christians, conservative, who say that no Christian should ever use Zechariah 13.6 to be speaking about Jesus Christ, because if you do that, it's blasphemy. You're saying that Jesus is a false prophet. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I think the Liberty Bible Commentary, I, I know for sure, the Liberty, it's a very thick, it has like parallel columns. I think that's the name of it, the the. It's, I think it was produced by Liber, uh, Liberty University, Jerry Falwell's place. So it gets crazier than this. I mean, could you imagine something that's more— here you have a prophecy of a false prophet because it looks like Jesus. Bingo. Let's just rip it out of context. It's, it's really unbelievable. In the secular world, if you, if you would do that, if you would take a— a passage from a business contract out of context like that, they would throw you in jail for fraud and disbar you, right? And then people say, oh, the Jews are no good and the Jews are liars and we're the Antichrist. Could you imagine? Could you imagine that, my holy kindle? 
you know what we have to put up with? It's really mind blowing. Next verse. The next verse is actually used by the book of Matthew, and I believe this is the other part of the passage that you're referring to. And that's where it says, this is all messianic, and here HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that all those shepherds, now this is not a good shepherd, <laughs> even though a good shepherd comes up in the, in the Gospels, these are all the rulers over Klal Yisrael. They're going to be done away with. Their sovereignty, their shlita over the Jewish people is going to end, and the flock is going to spread apart. Awake, rise up. When the shepherd is smitten, so then the flock will finally be able to be scattered, and God's hands will be against all these. Now, the shepherd, you should know these are full shepherds because this is a, a theme, a running theme in the same book. In fact, in the chapters that introduce Zechariah 13, in both in chapter 10 and in chapter 11, you have the full shepherds. And the famous, the, the shepherd you're most familiar with, the full shepherd versus the true shepherd, you're most familiar with is Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel 34, that there's a prophecy against the shepherds of Israel. These are the false teachers, the false leaders, the, the oppressors of the Jewish people. And God is going to set up the true shepherd who represents God. God is the true shepherd. Now, John is going to use that, but we're going to set that aside. But what's very striking is how this is used in the book of Matthew. In Matthew 26, it uses this to say that Jesus is the shepherd, and he is going to be crucified, and that's going to cause all you, the disciples, to be um, dispersed and without a guide and without a... So it's completely misappropriated in Matthew chapter 26 that comes right after the Eucharist. So it's just, and if we go to Zechariah chapter 8 and 9, there we see that the enemies of the Jews, the, the, so the non Jews are divided, the non Jewish world, I should say, is divided into three parts. Now, this is Almost always mistranslated. It will be in the whole land. Is all the Messianic age. That two, now what it says is pishnayim, that means the mouth of two. Karsu will be cut off. They will perish. Vahashlishis and a third part, Yvosebra, will remain. What is that? So I didn't count it up, but I think in most Bibles it says two thirds, as in, you know, you know, two thirds as a, like a fraction. It doesn't mean that at all. Those who are religious Jews who are familiar with Pishnaim, Al Pishnaim Edim Yokum Dovar, Deuteronomy chapter 17, for example, on the mouth of two witnesses could something be established, but not on the mouth of one witness, as an example. That's the language used here. So two, the mouth of two, it does not say two-thirds. I know the King James does, I know they do, and it's a huge mistake. These are the false witnesses. So first I'll explain to you what it's referring to. The world in the Messianic age will be divided into three parts. Two corporate entities will be destroyed because they are the false witnesses. Now, think, my sweet Kindleach, where do we have the false witnesses being taunted in the Bible, in the Navi? Think, think, think. 
So those of you who who wash yourself, who fill yourself with the words of the prophets of blessed memory, will recognize this very quickly. Remember, witnesses, now you should know, Atem Eidai no Meshem, you're my witnesses. But before we get to Isaiah 43, verse 10, Isaiah mocks the other nations of the world and says, bring forth your witnesses, tell us about the former things. That's the precursor to Isaiah 43, verse 10. So Isaiah mocks the nations of the world. Please, it's very sarcastic. Please, he says to the goyim, the nations of the world, who are not, not good goyim. You'll see why this is very important. He says, please, tell us your testimony. You're going to tell us about the future. Please, step forward. Tell us about the former things. You can't tell us anything. You have nothing to say. Shtusim. And then Isaiah turns to the righteous remnant of Israel, and he says, Atam Eida Onu Hashem, you are my witnesses, talking to the Jews, Avdi, my servant, which is going to come all over here, all the way through Isaiah 83, Asher Bacharti, whom I have chosen, Laman Teidu, so that you will know, Visaminuli, that you should believe me, Visavinu, and you should understand, Kiani, who that I am God, Lefonai, Loi Noitzael, before me there was no God formed, neither will be one after me, 43 verse 11, continue saying, that that um, there is no savior, Anoichi, Anoichi, I even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no other savior. Let those words echo in Dow's theological seminary. Let those words echo in the Vatican. Let those words be heard at Moody Bible Institute. Let those words be heard in Greece. Let those words be heard in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Let those words echo around the world. Okay? So be very careful. You see my sweet Kindleloch? Be very careful to go back to the original, or else you're so, so lost. And moreover, these passages, whether it's Zechariah or Isaiah there is an enormous use of poetry. When I say poetry, I don't mean Shakespearean poetry. I mean that there's a use of symbolic language. It to be very, very careful with. And if you're reading a translation, you're a slave to the translator, a servant to the translator. And that's why I plead with you to learn Lashon HaKadish, the holy language, which is a very small language, very tiny language. And it's a very easy language. It's a very precise language. It's a language, biblical Hebrew is less than 9,000 words. And 90% of Tanakh is using only 10% of those words. It's, it's really very easy. It's all roots. So I beg you, like Pishnayim means the mouth of two. Who are those two ent of the nations of the world? So it's, you can figure out whoever you want to. There are two major forces in the world now that are wicked of the nations of the world, and they will be destroyed. However, there will be a third, not one third as in a thirty-three percent, thirty-three point three percent. No, it means a third segment of the goyim, a third, not as a fraction, who will be the bnei noach, who will be the righteous of the nations of the world, and that's what Mashiach is very devoted to. The Mashiach is devoted to who? To the redemption of who? We, you know this already. You've been studying together of the nations of the world. That means the. Goyim, who are loyal to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Remember, this is the same holy book where you just had a few chapters earlier, 10 of all the nations and languages of the world. What are they going to do? They're going to grab the shirt of a, a Jew, 823, and say, Nelchim, let us go with you, because we have heard. 
By the way, we have heard same words as Isaiah 53 when the Goyim are speaking, Mi hemin asenu, who would have believed our report? Shmua, ki shaman. Look, those of you who understand even a little Hebrew right now are going to fall on the floor and do tshuva. Right now. Shema, here. This is a root that every, I think every person knows, hero is or Lord. Shamanu is a report. It's the same word. Look at Isaiah 83, verse 1. Me hem in Lushmosenu. Who would have believed our Shmua? Shema. And then go to Zechariah 8 23. Same word. Let us go with you, Kishomanu, because we have heard, sweet Kindlach, now is the time to renounce all idolatry. Now is the time to renounce all foolish things. Throw it out the window. Now is the time to purify yourself. Now is the time to touch nothing unclean. And all this is a precursor to Mashiach, my sweet holy brothers and sisters. There's no more time. We're here. We're here. We're here. It's happening now. It's unfolding now. Why is it folding, unfolding now in Sudarim in orders of events that are, unf- that are unfolding so quickly? And you know, my holy brothers and sisters, it's not like you have some rabbi in Jerusalem telling you this. Open up all the newspapers in the world. All the news, whether they're the horrible news or good, but <laughs> you know what's in the news, right? You know what's in the news every day, every minute. What's in the news cycle? Do I need to tell you? I don't need to tell you. What just happened? A tremendous trauma. What's happening? The world is lining up for again. Do I need to tell you this? Am I making this up? Am I exaggerating something? Is this a conspiracy theory? You know it's not. This is the time now to rid yourself of all the clothing you have that smells of this tobacco. Touch nothing unclean. And then look at verse 9. Uh, of Zechariah 13. We're going through the whole chapter. This is where it ends. And then what does Hashem do? Just so you see clearly. So you, there's not, I'm not. Vehevesi es hashlishis. And I will take the third part. Remember, the two parts, first parts, are the two entities in the world that are against Hashem. However you want to figure that out, I don't think it's complicated. Don't send me 50 emails. There's two entities that are enemies with Hashem, whatever it is. <laughs> you know, this is not complicated. My life is threatened enough. You don't have to figure out where are the two enemies of Hashem today. So, and what will Hashem do? He's going to purify the third. How? I remember when I was in Indonesia, and I was on the island of Papua, so the western part is Indonesian, and I was in Freeport, which is the largest gold mines in the world. The, the largest source of gold in the world is on these mountains in Indonesia. It's something you can't even believe. And they're 15,000 feet up. I'm not kidding. I needed a doctor's note to go up to the top of the mountains where we studied and preached up there in the mountains of Indonesia. The, you won't believe me, the mountains are gold. That means the all the rocks glisten with gold. I'm not kidding. There's more security up there than you can imagine. And they literally have earth movers. I never even knew there was such a thing. They have earth movers there that are pulling down mountains and an earth mover is the size of a house. Imagine someone's driving a house. <laughs> they have caterpillar earth movers. I never even knew such a thing could exist, but they have them there. And they move. It's like a house with a tractor. with a thing. And, they're, and the imamish, the water that runs down from this mountain is glistening with gold. Now, So you have a rock 
that has gold ore in it, how do you extract the gold and get rid of it? Through heat. So the the righteous, the B'nai Noach, the righteous among the nations of the world, that's the Hasidei Umas Oilam, so they have to endure the vicissitudes of the Jewish people, Hashem is going to refine them with heat, whatever that means. They're going, they're going to be preserved, they're going to celebrate Sukkot with the Jewish people, but they're going to undergo their own vicissitudes, so they're purified. Like what? Like a gold. How do we extract gold? Gold, gold is a metal that m- melts fairly at not such a high temperature. So it, that's how they extract the gold f- from the ore, and that's what's going to happen. And then we go to Zechariah 14. That's all Mashiach. How this all applies to Matthew 27, it's a complete misappropriation, complete misappropriation. This is the time now to do tshuva, my brothers and sisters. This is it. Not to, It's happening now. We're here. Why did Hashem choose you and not your great-great-grandfather? I don't know. Me, not my great I don't know. But we're here, and it's time to do tshuva. Thank for you for your thoughtful question. If you enjoy this program... Please like and subscribe. Adon Olah, Asher Malach, V'terem Kol Yetzir Nivra, Let Nasa, Bechev Tzokor, Azai Melech, Azai Melech, Shemu Nikra, V'achare, Lord, I'm not